Welcome to The Mushroom's Apprentice. My guest today is Darren LeBaron, a world-renowned educator in ethnomycology and psychedelic studies. Based in the UK and Jamaica, he is also a grassroots community activist and influencer. With a background in creative arts, organic horticulture, and permaculture, he is the creator of Shroom Shop, a mushroom cultivation initiative that engages local communities, schools, and business enterprises alike. His website is darrenlebaron.com, and that is D-A-R-R-E-N and lebaron, L-E-B-A-R-O-N dot com. All right. Welcome, Darren. I'm so thrilled you're here. I'm happy to be here, man. I appreciate the invitation to come and share on your platform, man, with your audience. Yeah, yeah. They are going to enjoy you, I tell you. And so, as I said earlier, what I love to do is just start with just who is Who's Darren LeBaron? What's your background? Where did you grow up? And and what were the influences that brought you into this area of, of uh, exploration and I would say expertise? Mm. So who is Darren LeBaron? I always answer that now the same because I'm out here trying to work it out myself. So I'm here, you know, on a journey of self-discovery. And as long as I can remember, I've been trying to work myself out. I didn't know all the ways and tools and approaches to be able to do that but as I grew and matured I would like to think I um I started to learn about di various different disciplines so I was born and raised in the UK London I'm first generation born in the UK my family's from the Caribbean Barbados and you know as long as I can remember when it comes to this path of enlightenment and development it all started when I was probably about four or five years old and I just knew that like I wanted to be Spider-Man and um, I wanted to activate my powers. Like I believe we had powers. I wanted to activate my powers. And I learned that the power of the mind at a young age is a powerful thing because, you know, any for everything from things that was in my imagination could manifest, you know, the dream world could manifest. You know, I just saw that I had enough experiences to know that, you know, what some people might put to the sides, you know, it was like just the imagine. that's just your imagination. That's just the dream. That's just this, like for me, were well, really important, powerful things. So with that said, from a child, I've been, you know, wanting to understand myself. And then when I got into school education, I realized at a very early, it wasn't even school at nursery. I realized that, you know, I was being misinformed. <laughs> I don't know my spirit. It just didn't resonate with a lot of the teachings that I was getting. You know, I went to um, Catholic nurseries, primary and secondary schools and um there was just a lot that you know I questioned and um in my later years of education when I say later years you know in secondary or what you guys will call high school maybe um I was a challenging student you know I challenged my tutors a lot my teachers a lot like as far as like if you're saying this then how comes this and if you're saying that then how comes that and you know just like and I'll be honest I didn't know the answers to what I was asking but I knew that the teachers didn't have the answers, but they were trying to, I call it the illusion of authority. Like this, they had this authoritative place and space where they were like teaching me something. I was like, I don't even think you really know. So I'm just saying all that to say that that inspired me in my late teens to really start doing what I would call self-study, man, knowledge of self, like just trying to work out myself, starting to, you know, I bought my first books, you know, of in my first books of, you know, independently, um, and that was all inspired through rap music. You know, rap music were my first teachers. It was like a few handful of artists at that time. You know, Public Enemy were one of them. Ice Cube was another. There's a handful of others who were teaching and sharing shit stuff through their music. That was um, really inspirational. And I was like, how do they know this stuff? Where are they getting this type of information from? And I started to learn more about Black history, Black culture. And, you know, and that led me to want to know more outside of history of what was going on in Africa. You know, what were we doing then? You know, how did, what did we teach? What did, what was our spiritual systems like? And that's basically how I've got to where I'm at now. And if we're, I guess you have are familiar with me because of the mushroom and psychedelic narrative, um, and that's just been a lifelong journey into me being interested in like getting into altered states of consciousness. Um, for, like I said, the dream stuff that led me to learning about different, you know, yoga practices, as I said, you know, lucid dreaming and, you know, you name it, man, just like any and everything that was like beyond the physical I was getting into. And when psychedelics came up, it first actually came up when I was at school and it was pretty much what the white boys that I went to school with were into. 
And uh, for me, that was like, nah, man, psychedelics ain't, you know, you're, they're just going to basically grow up and be druggies, man. They're just druggies, isn't it? You know, me and my friends, we, if anything, we would just smoke a little bit of weed, you know, have a little drink. And, that, you know, those were our vices. And um, it was just kind of be, been on this ongoing journey of exploring that and getting deeper into the African spiritual systems. Um, I learned that they had these concoctions and brews. They refer to it as plant medicine and stuff like that. And at that time, my perspective was that this was to do with, you know, like, you know, if you get a cut, they had plants that can heal you. You know, I was, I'm privy to this type of stuff. There was like natural plants. And, you know, if you've got a headache, they had this for you. There was like a plant for everything. But when they were referencing, you know, using plants to communicate with the ancestors and stuff like that, it like I didn't know what it all meant. It just like it didn't add, you know, it, it just didn't make sense at that time specifically. And then during that period of time, this is a long way I'm sharing with you, but that during that period of time, I came into, or should I say, I reconnected with the works of Kalindi E.E. So Kalindi E.E. is known, was known in our community for years, man, for decades. And he taught about the African origins of martial arts. So that he used to come to the UK at least once a year for like 20, over 20 years, you know, like I was in my late teens, early twenties, and this guy would come and teach, do these martial arts demonstrations and stuff like that. So that's what I knew him for. That's what he was known for. And then around 2000, between 2008, 2010, that's when I first came into contact with, you know, the knowledge of psychedelics being not just this thing that these guys that I went to school with were dealing with. And it had, there was more to it. And I was being redirected to Kalindi and his work. And it was around 2011 that I actually spoke to one of my other teachers who was like, you need to speak to Kalindi because this isn't my forte, but I know a man whose forte it is. And I'm like, yeah, but Kalindi's the martial arts guy, man. I'm talking about mushrooms and DMT and ayahuasca and all these other things I was learning about. And like, he's the man that you need to go and see. Then there was another one of my elders said the same thing. She was like, check out this DVD. And it was a DVD of Kalindi. E, and he was talking about ancient Egypt or better yet, Kemet, which I had, you know, a background in doing research on. And Again, it just blew my mind because he was sharing stuff that I'd seen many times before. And um, but he was showing what was hidden in plain sight, what was always in my face, but just wasn't clear. And I didn't have the sight at that time. And um, fortunately for me, I had some really cool teachers, Wayne Chandler being one of them, who was a student of Kalindi. He was a student in his martial arts space. And he says, you know what? Let me try and put you in touch with Kalindi. And he did. And about an hour later, Kalindi was phoning my phone. And in that phone call, it was like, Wayne said that you're interested in psychedelics and stuff. I'm like, yeah, man, I literally just had my first psychedelic experience, you know, within the last month. And, you know, I wanted to learn more. And he pointed me towards you. And he goes, well, ironically, I'm coming to the UK, you know, in a few weeks um, for the Breaking Convention, which is now the largest conference in Europe. But it was the very first one at that time, 2011. He goes, I'm coming. He goes, if you if you've got the time and space, you should come along to it. And I'm an event organizer in the UK. So Wayne said, like, maybe you guys can collaborate and do some event stuff like you do with other folks. And I was like, yeah, man, I can do that. And we've done it. And that's kind of how this has all happened. So you've got the full Monty there, kind of like condensed. But that's how it all that's that's how I'm in this space now, teaching and sharing about mushrooms and psychedelics based on my own inspirations, being taught and educated by some amazing teachers and Clindy E being one of them as well. Yeah, yeah, that is so fated. It's really, it's pure fate. You know, you're you're clearly on your path. It makes me think when you were sharing earlier about being in, in just high school, regular school, you know, and questioning these teachers and then realizing, you know, I don't really know, but they don't either. And then mm -hmm. that's setting you on the course. It just reminded me, I, I collect quotes and my very favorite quote of all time says, every man has two educations. The first he's given, the second, more important, he gives to himself. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you very clearly did that. Now, I want to hear about the psychedelics. But first, I want to hear about this background in horticulture and permaculture. Mm. So just talk about that for, for a bit here. What got you yeah. into that? So um, that's ironically inspired by where I'm at now in Barbados. So just over 21 years ago, my daughter, who's now 22, she was nine months old at that time. And I had my first very trip to Barbados. Um, that's where my family comes from, like I said. And cut a long story short, man, I was seeing banana trees and mango trees and all these amazing tropical trees for the very first time in my life in adulthood. 
my favorite food. So like seeing them grow for the first time, I've seen them in the supermarkets before. I've seen them being sold, you know, in the local markets, but not being able to just reach, touch, grab, smell, taste. And I was taken aback by it all. And then not only were those experiences, you know, really key, I come to realize that I came from a family of, you know, horticulturalists and farmers and people that knew about the soil and knew about agriculture. And then not only did my family know this, it's like all the neighbors did. Everybody around knew about this stuff. This was like a way of life. Like every day when I was at my great grandmother's house, rest in peace, who was alive at that time, she, um, you know, there wasn't a day that would go by where somebody wasn't coming along saying, yo, I got coconuts, yo, I've just got some breadfruit. We just done our harvest. We're bringing it. And she was like, yo, we got the mangoes and I'll get my cousin to drop them down a bit later on. And I witnessed and experienced true community for the first time true common unity community common unity through food and um you know i came from a community where you could just about knock on your neighbor's door and ask them for some sugar or you got a couple of eggs there and that was that had filtered out that culture those traditions like most people don't even know or even communicate with their neighbors nowadays but for me to see that and witness that i realized that i'd been cut off from a lot a lot of experiences that wouldn't have happened due to these historical circumstances and um, at the same time, I realized that I was doing my family a disservice by not having this knowledge and information, having a nine month year old daughter and not being able to provide for her. Like I would be going the same route of being relying on supermarkets to to grow and raise my daughter. And I decided not to. And I went back to college. I went back to uni and started studying horticulture. I started volunteering. In fact, I started volunteering at a local food growing initiative. I went from volunteering and then my children were homeschooled as well. So I was going back to learn and they were learning at the same time. So we were just learning at this amazing 12 acre site, learning about organic food growing. All I wanted to do was grow strawberries. That was my goal. I just want to grow some strawberries. And um, I was learning how to grow strawberries, but I was learning some other bits and pieces on the way too. And then I signed up and done my level one in organic food growing. I done my level two. Then I done my introductory to permaculture. I just got the bug, man. I got the bug for it all. And what happened was I was on this spiritual path. Well, I was always been on this spiritual path, learning about mushrooms and magic mushrooms are coming into the, the dialogue. And then I'm studying horticulture. And like my two favorite units was composting for my level one. And then when I done my level two, it was soil science. I love compost and I love soil. And then I found out the magic behind composting and the magic behind soil was this thing called mycelium. Now, what's mycelium? And mycelium is this thing with mushrooms. I'm like, mushrooms again? I'm like, these two, my the two most important things in life right now for me is this spiritual path and this food growing path. And mushrooms has been the answer. And it reminded me what Kalindi said with his journey of martial arts. When he came to the end of diving in deep, he came across mushrooms. I was like, it's like, wherever you go, whatever you get into, it's like the end, the, the pot at the end of the rainbow is going to be mushrooms. And that was like how it all happened. And with that said, I'm, I've been an educator and worked in my community before psychedelics, before mushrooms and before horticulture in just, you know, being an activist in my community and teaching and sharing everything from football, music, creative arts, you know, trying to find tangible alternatives for primarily young people that I worked with who they refer to as the hard to reach people in the hoods and the ghettos of London and giving them tangible alternatives to like trying to make the right decision. And with all those things that I've done over the years, football, music, Music, filmmaking, you name it, mushrooms seem to have been the one that I've had the best progress with in the engagement and true transformation. So yeah, man, that's how all of that has happened. That is absolutely awesome. Oh my goodness, you're speaking my language. I wish I had homeschooled my daughters. I didn't know back then what I know now. And I just love that you've done that because I think that's also very, very important right now. We need to get our kids out of these state-run schools. And and then, oh my goodness, the farm. Do you have a farm or do you do you run a farm right now? Or so no, man. It's like I'm currently in Barbados. I've been moving and grooving for a good few years now where I've not had the stability to, you know, my farm was my garden, my family garden, you know. And um I'm no I'm no longer in that place and space no more. So most of my cultivation is around mushroom cultivating. So I've been doing a lot of that in my apartment and stuff like that. 
but I have many satellite projects that I've worked on, you know, like we have a community in the UK and places and spaces where I do my teaching and sharing where, you know, I've got the ability to still continue to exchange and that's with the, the crops, the people and all of that type of good stuff. So, you know, that's where I'm at, but in the UK, but in Jamaica, in Barbados here, you know, that's what, as I said, I brought my toolbox with me and that's what we're establishing out here. That's like the work that I'm doing on the ground. That's great. That's great. Are you growing medicinal mushrooms as well? Growing all mushrooms, man. It's really important. So when I say all mushrooms, yes, medicinal mushrooms. But, you know, like, I'm not sure how much you know, but in the Caribbean, as in general, if I generalize, mushrooms get a bad rap. They get a bad rap all around the world for the most part, you know, even in the UK around. It's like, you got to be careful with mushrooms. They're deadly. They're poisonous. They're toxic. This, that and the other. And then, you know, you speak to the choir and obviously we know, but for the, you know, the average everyday Folks, they're like not not understanding why mushrooms are what they are. But you come to a Barbados and a Jamaica and mushrooms are referred to as duppy umbrella or duppy parasols. And that duppy or duppy means, you know, ghost or spirit, you know, and in a highly religious, you know, Christian orientated um, environments, you know, like duppies get a bad rap. Therefore, mushrooms get a bad rap. There's this whole, you know missing link so when you mention mushrooms to people here there's two conversations that you have this like are you talking about the mushrooms that are on pizzas or are you talking about the mushrooms that get you high and that's about it and most people don't like the mushrooms on pizza and they don't like the mushrooms that get you high so there's a big gap as far as education so that's what darren's doing here we're educating people not even so much you know like medicinal mushrooms psychedelic mushrooms it's like what are mushrooms do you know that mushrooms are the sole creators they are the ones who facilitate and hold space within the soil so that any and everything that comes out of the soil, including you, can sort themselves out. So they provide all of the nutrients to the plants and they provide all the nutrients to the plants that then go inside of you and just making that relationship and connection and creating a new story and a new narrative for people to understand what this technology is all about. Yes, yes. I think of mycelium as really like the nervous system of the planet. Is it is. <laughs> I mean, it is it is you know that's and that's what i teach i teach exactly the same thing you know our mycelium network is our central nervous system and the same way it holds us together the mycelium holds like i refer to this big piece of shit together because earth is just a big piece of shit you know and all of the my all the organisms are eating and processing what it provides processing it and passing it out and gifting it back to where it came from and that's how it becomes you know and you know whether it's farmyard manure worm castings, all those microorganisms, they're just recycling, you know, nature's re main, most important recyclers, which is the, fun the fungi. And that network keeps all of that functioning. So I understand what it is, you know, it's as above, so below, as we've been, so without, you know, that's what we're dealing with, man. So once you understand how the soil works, you can get a better idea of how you work. You can also get an idea of how the cosmos works. You know, there's so many layers to it. And that's why we refer to it as like alien technology, but that's another subject. <laughs> We can certainly uh, explore that. Uh, okay, wow, that you're such an inspiration. I'm just sitting here, just taking all this in, and and I'm so right in line with you, Darren. My goodness. Now, I want to get into. Well, first of all, talk about that first mushroom journey you experienced, because you're you are a, a kind of a rare gem, I think, in terms of clearly you were asking those deeper questions from a younger age like i think you're you've been very much in touch shall we say from a young a young age because this whole path just seems so it as i said fated just so natural for you and uh and so i would love to know how that first journey was for you and how it affected you so my very first mushroom journeys if i'll be honest they weren't all that and why I say they weren't all that was simply because I, prior to mushrooms, I'd had two other psychedelic experiences. So my first love was actually salvia divinorum. And ironically, yeah, there you go, man. And um, I fell in love with her. She treated me very well. And ironically, you mentioned Martin Ball. So he was a been a big inspiration. And actually, Martin Ball was the first psychedelic event I ever hosted in the UK. Really? But yeah, he was my first guest that I invited to the UK. So it was in between Kalindi doing his thing. He was coming, but then in, back, in between that time, I was reading Martin's books, his mushroom book and his salvia book. And he was like, I can't remember where he was going, Scotland or somewhere, man. He was coming to Europe. I was like, if you're coming to Europe, you should come to London. And yeah, we we hosted him in London. Well, I hosted him in London for, for my first psychedelic event. 
And that was a bit geared around my Salvia Divinorum experiences. So I'm saying that to say Salvia, and then it was DMT. They are very, you know, they uh, they put you out there, man. They put you out there, out there. So I was put out there, out there from the gate with Salvia and DMT. So by the time I was in mushrooms, I tried my, my first mushrooms, actually Amanitas, and nothing really happened, you know, like I just felt nauseous. And, you know, and then I puked up a little bit and then I got a bit of a head rush and I was like, ah, what's all this type about mushrooms? And because at that time, psilocybin mushrooms had made the transition from being legal to illegal, but amanitas were still readily available. And what was happening, I was buying these grow kits, mushroom grow kits, which were legal, trying to grow my psilocybin mushrooms, but I was getting no joy. Man. I was just getting contaminations and stuff. So um, during that period of time, that's when I'd been communicating with Kalindi and he's like, I'm coming through. And um, he came through, man. And like, I was actually self-taught by Kalindi, man. He was in my apartment. He was the one who taught me how to like, he was like, yeah, you don't need to buy these grow kits no more. Everything you need is in the cupboard. We're just going to quickly hit the store, grab some rice flour. And, like, I'm going to show you the way. And he showed me the way. And um, then I was encouraged to have what we would refer to as, you know, the high dose on a macro dose, the hero's dose of mushrooms. And that's when mushrooms started to reveal what they have for me. So it took a few jump. It took took a few jumps in you know, like the double Dutch kind of thing before I found my flow with the mushrooms. But by the time I did, I knew that's that's what I was actually after. Mm -hmm. So what am I saying? What they've all done for me, they removed the veil. They affirmed things that I knew as a child, but doubted myself about. They affirmed that, yes, this isn't as physical and tangible as you know, as as it was made out to be, you know, I've been I've gone on many different voyages. It showed me many different things, but the most important thing it gave for me at the early days, because initially I just dived in there to become Spider Man. I'm like, yo, man, I just want to activate powers and walk through walls and all that type of stuff, man. But then what it enabled me to do, I say, the key thing that I got from it was that it, I lightened my load. It allowed me to lighten my load, so it revealed to me things that I've been carrying around with me that were not mine and or that I've created that I don't need to be carrying around with me. And, you know, and that in itself allowed me to just kind of like, yeah, loosen up and pop my collar a little and be like, yeah, man, like this stuff isn't mine and I don't need to own it anymore. And, you know, and that was everything from, you know, my own fears, my own insecurities, my own, you know, traumas, the ones that like I said, the ones I've inherited, epigenetics, like, you know, just down to the ones that I've created where I'm walking around saying that I'm Darren, you know, Darren Springer, that's my birth, you know, that's my birth. And like, it's like, they show me that you're not even that guy. You're not, you're not, you're not even that. You're like, you're more than that. You know, you're before all of that. And so, yeah, some of these voyages were like mind blowing and life changing and all the rest of it. And all I knew is that everybody that I know needed to do this. You know, my friends, my family, even my enemies. It's like, yo, man, you all need a dose of this. And um, it took me to have a few challenging experiences for me to realize that maybe this is, isn't for everybody and I don't need to be trying to shove it down everybody's throat. And then it taught me just to be a, an embodiment of the mushrooms and just be a walking, living and breathing testimony and an account. And that's what I do. And now I teach people that they're actually mushrooms having a human experience. You know, that's like what I do. And yeah, from those early experiences. I love that. I, you and partially answered a question. Anyway, I was going to ask you about any challenging experiences, but also with, there's always two sides, right? So is there a dark side? With the mushroom yeah man well we live in a, a reality where we deal with a lot with polarities you know a light and dark there's not one without the other there's no left without a right there's no up without down type of vibes mushroom definitely can take you beyond that but you know when we're in this 3d realm it's definitely based upon that you know our perspective our lens and yeah man i don't you so when i do my workshops i always give a shout out on my talks or presentations i always start them off by acknowledging our ancient alien ancestors the mushrooms our oldest ancestors that we know and you know in this place and space and I give them their kudos, but I say they've revealed to me the good, the bad and the beautiful, ugly inside of myself. And I feel forever indebted for that. You know, like, yeah, it's not all light bubbles, rainbows and unicorns. There's a, another side that there's a shadow, there's a devil, there's a Diablo, you know, however you want to see it or interpret it, that it, it also reveals to you. You know, if you're in the middle and the mushrooms swing you around to the pendulum of beauty and you know, all the amazing things, just know that the pendulum swings back around. It's going to show you the, the polarity, the other side of that, man. It's going to show you, you know, I always say this, I share this one with you, you know, I've, you know, I sat for a few people as well. So when I, you know, was working with this, with this brother going through his journey, 
and I knew where the mushrooms had him. You know, like you've, you know, mushrooms are, you know, they do their thing. You know, there's no, you can't put your finger on them. But he, you know, he, he took his dose and he went up to his room and he came down about an hour later and he was like, Darren, I'm a god. <laughs> the mushrooms are real to me. He's a god. And I was sitting there, I was like, yeah, man, you're a god. That's right. But, you know, it's time to go back to your room because, you know, I was in talk by Kalindi and the whole idea was, you know, just stay in a room, you know, not not to be distracted away from light, music and all the rest of it. It's like, so he came down. I was like, yeah, man, cool, man. That's it. Go back to your room. No, enjoy your journey. And he did. And he came back down about 45 minutes later and he goes, Darren, I'm a dickhead. <laughs> I said, that's right, man. You're a dickhead, man. And go back in the room. And I knew that he was going through the motions, man. All of it was being revealed to him, you know, the good side, the bad side, that you, you're an amazing being, you're an amazing species, but there's some stuff that you're messing up on as well, you know, and there's some stuff that you can fix and correct. And, you know, and some people don't like that side of what the mushrooms, when they when they discipline you and stuff like that. And, you know, and, you know, some people might even refer to it as a bad trip, man, I had a real bad trip, you know, because they were giving me a hard time and they might have been telling you stuff about your stuff, self that you don't want to hear and you've been suppressing and wanting to continue to suppress and like, nah, man, we're going to, we're going to pull that up out of you, man, and put it right in front of you. And so, yeah, man, is there a dark side? Yeah, there is that, you know, element to it, you know, but I would say I refer to it like there's definitely challenging experiences, but with most challenges, you know, you know, like there's some, there's some good stuff that comes out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I see every mushroom journey as an initiation. And that's what I tell people who I sit for, like you're initiating yourself and we can prepare you as best we can and make sure you're safe. But once you go in, all bets are off. Like that's what call. initiation is. You don't get to know what's going to happen. You have to go in there with full trust and uh big open heart. Yeah, and yeah. So Kalind Kalindi's initiation for me, because people would say, oh, you work closely with Kalindi. Like what was the teaching? And I was like, it's like really straightforward. You know, his teachings were grow mushrooms, eat mushrooms. That was it. Just That was repeated all the time. Grow mushrooms, eat mushrooms. And then when you're ready to eat mushrooms, you go in that room by yourself in the dark, no music, no lights, no singing bowl, no nothing. And you stay in there and you hack it. And the goal is to lay on the floor and try not to fall off. Huh? You know, like... That's right. I remember <laughs> saying that. Oh my goodness. I feel the same way. I have never, I don't want any music. I was before I, when I first started working with the mushroom, my friend and I were listening to Terrence McKenna who said mm -hmm. lying eyes closed in silent darkness. And I was like, okay, yeah. that's what yeah, we're yeah. going to do. Yeah. And I have done that ever since. Yeah, I don't want any outside interference. I mean, I don't mind the sound of birds and a car going by, but you know, I want to be in in the yeah. uh, past realm of mind and beyond, what whatever it is, the mystery. That's right, because he'd always say, "It goes, you might have an agenda, you might have some intentions, but the mushrooms have an agenda too." <laughs> you know, so like you said, all bets are off. Like, um, just be prepared to step into the unknown, and that's why you said it's always a self initiation, man. You're always stepping into the unknown. I will just say this: just know that. I started off in my family being the one and only one that was really into this type of stuff. And, you know, many moons later, many cycles later, many journeys later, just know that I've got family members who are co-signing this and have initiated their friends and their external family members and stuff like that, man. That's just that's just where we're at with it. You know, they realized that I didn't jump out of any windows. I wasn't walking down the street telling people that I'm God and, you know, all the things that they've seen in the Hollywood movies. And that actually you seem to be like, all right, you seem to be actually doing better and like, Maybe I need some of that in my life. What's going on, Darren? What is it all about? And I'm like, grow mushrooms and eat mushrooms, man. That's like, <laughs> that's the way forward. That's how you can get there for yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's, it keeps it very simple and succinct. And then you just let the mystery take care of the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Do you have a school? You should have a school, Darren. I mean, I know you're teaching, but I mean, I don't know. I feel like... Well Ironically, my I mentioned my children were homeschooled. So this is going back some time now. But yeah, I set up a school, I set up a supplementary school, you know, because I knew that much. I, as I said, I had these experience of being educated in these schools myself. And I'm like, am I setting my children up for the same thing? And then most people are like, yeah, because you, you have to send your children to school. Well, legally, you don't in the UK, you know, like your children just need to have some form of education, which can be a school. But there are options. And one of those options is the home. And I thought that's the, probably the best place for them to have their education. And then a lot of people, when you homeschool your children, they think that you're just going to keep your children in the house and they're not going <laughs> to they're not going to integrate with society and real, and real people. Alternative to that, we actually had the best experiences because every day we was out at science museums and just doing fun stuff. We had fun learning and it was learning about real stuff, too. But in addition to that, we realized that there was a social skill 
that I learned from school that I thought was the most important thing that I learned. And that was like making friends as well as making enemies, you know, like you've got to learn that there's like you're in this loving environment, but you know, you go out in the real world, there's people who don't like it, there's people who, you know, are not as nice as your parents and your friends and family that we've got in this immediate circle. So like you've got to experience the real world, real world in that regards. And so that's why we was inspired to set up a supplementary school, me and my partner at that time, we engaged other families who were homeschooling and set up a supplementary school. And like, that's where myself, my partner, who was also a teacher, always a teacher and educator, we gained with other teachers and educators and started educating. And then over the years I've been teaching in schools, public schools and private schools and, you know, and then more recently, the last few years, we set up the first Mushroom Academy in the UK. So um, we've got this, uh, an accreditation that I developed for schools for mushroom cultivation as well as mushroom enterprise and young children are in school. So I, I step back from teaching on the front line. I do more teacher training now because I'm trying, I said, uh, I just said it to these guys here the other day. I says like, if you want to pull me out of retirement and teaching in schools, like I'm happy to do it in Barbados. I'm happy to do it in Jamaica, but it's unlikely that I'll go back to the UK and do that stuff. I'm happy to continue doing some teacher training and getting the teachers up to speed with stuff. But out here, like I love teaching and working with young people in particular and just seeing the true transformations take place. But um, yeah, I'm here right now. I brought my toolbox with me, as I said, and yeah, maybe there'll be a school here too, man, an academy here going. Oh, that would just be amazing. Just amazing. When we're done, I'm going to have to get your birth date. I want to kind of run your chart because, I mean, you're a natural born teacher, clearly. Teacher, communicator, and uh, gosh, everything you are in touch with is just exactly what we need at this time, truly. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, mean, I, said, I always say, man, I've been raised by and taught by the best from my mother through to these rappers that inspired me, the my spiritual teachers and all the rest of it. But it was these students, man. Like my, my teaching in school, you know, public schools, was actually working with what they refer to the hard to reach group. So it was like children who were in what we call PRUs, PRUs, pupil referral units. So students who weren't doing good in class, they've either been kicked out of class, kicked out of school or returning from prison. You know, these challenge students, SEN, you know, students with special educational needs. Although I was in the classes with you know, the normal students, let's just say the average students, like a lot of my time and investments was in those children because I like to see transformation. It's like, if little Johnny's going to be the top student anyway, anybody can do that. You know, like he's well on his way, but like I want to work with the students who are not necessarily been ticked or earmarked for doing great. Like, because for me, that's where I see like my work is more effective. Like, like that's where true transformation takes place. So those students who I was working with initially in pupil referral units, as I said, they're like the bad boys and the rude boys of like the school and the community and stuff. So they're sending me in as the gardener. Not that I shared with you, but when I was studying my horticulture at that time, the my teachers at that time realized oh, that you're actually like known in the community. You do this educational stuff in music and creative arts and you're an activist there. And we're trying to develop a, like a young people's program in horticulture. And um, they was like, they're not been having too much traction with it because when they showed the flyers and the engagement that they was doing, they were like, one, the flyers didn't look too great. They looked like they, they was from the 1970s and stuff. And they were going to the wrong places where the young people are at. Like amazing growth and doing amazing work, but just like the outreach could have been tweaked slightly. So they asked me to come in and help them tweak the outreach work. And I was like, cool, man. And I, I started there. And then from developing the outreach and developing the program, it was like, would you help us deliver the program? And I was like, oh, you know, I'm not too sure about that. And it was like, you'll be perfect, man. And like, they was like, we'll pay for your, you know, your teacher training and stuff like that. And I did, and they did. And that was the beginning of me going into schools and teaching horticulture. And with these students who were pre from the pupil referral unit, for the most part, when I come into the classes, actually the first session, I can never forget my very first session, I got to the school. And this, I was like, yeah, I'm here to teach today. And they're like, yeah, can you just wait in this area, in the waiting area? I was like, okay, is everything all right? It's like, nah, there's been an incident in the school. And it was like, yeah, there was a class. It was like, um, a, basically there was a fight going on and the students were throwing snooker balls at each other. There was like a riot taking place in the school, literally. This is like my first day on the job. And I was like, oh my days, what have I got myself into? <laughs> you know, but I'm saying all that to say that following on those weeks, my students, they were flipping tables, flipping chairs. They were those kind of students. But um, I got them engaged and interested in horticulture and food growing, you know, because most of them were getting in trouble because they were trying to make quick money, fast money, trying to sell or they either selling drugs or trying to sell, you know, drugs and stuff like that. And I just took that same premise of like, yo, we're going to grow food and sell food. 
I'm going to show you how to turn food into a tangible alternative to generate money for yourself and make an income for yourself. But at the same time, before we make the money, we've got to know about these seeds. We've got to know about the soil and all the rest of it. So I was literally learning on the job one week and going into schools the next week, teaching the stuff that I was learning. And like, I'm saying all that to say that that's how I learned my trade and became what I would say an effective teacher and communicator in this space, just working with those guys because they was not interested in learning about food growing. Now I go to workshops, people are like, oh, I want to come to learn how to mushrooms. I'm like, this is the walk in the park, man. I can do this with my eyes closed because my my experience on the battlefield was like a lot more challenging than that. So yeah, man, that's just, I thought I'd share that with you. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I mean, you just have to learn how to speak their language because different audiences kind of have different languages, you know, depending on where yeah. you're where you are. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So let's talk about uh, one of the things I found so refreshing, a million things are refreshing about you, Darren, but you're speaking so candidly about connecting with the spirit realm with ancestors through the mushroom. Cause, Cause I've always said my very first mushroom journey, when I was done, I was like, this is a portal. This is a portal. Mm. The spirit world. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you won't hear a lot of people talking about it. We have a lot of academics and PhD, you know, and they'll lose their funding or, or their credibility or whatever. I mean, I get it. But I want to hear your experience with all of that, because I think yeah, it's well, important. Yeah, I guess I can speak on it because I'm not not an academia and I don't have any funding or anything like that that I'm, <laughs> that I'm depending on. So, yeah, I could do with some, but it is what it is. So, um, yeah, man, like I said, like even prior to mushrooms and psychedelics, you know, I've been on this path of, you know, spiritual development, and spiritual curiosity. And, you know, the ancestors have always come up on that journey, you know, you know, and even when I started to understand, you know, the Roman Catholic traditions and the other traditions that I was privy to, the Islamic traditions that, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with. I'm like, there's an element of that in there. But then when you move into these indigenous cultures, that seems to be the foundations of what that you know of, of what they're dealing with so you know to then dive into the psychedelic realm and like you said just being placed in that space you know in a place and space where whether they're ancestors or incarnate spirits or deities or archetypes things that are non-physical but are real um i i can't deny that man and some people just say like do you think they're really real is it like yeah i like think everything is real you know like as long as i experience it and it's you know, third dimensional or in my non uh, metaphysical, like, and it, like for me, it's all part of my experience and it all goes into my database and archives of experience. So for me, it put me in a place and space where, you know, just like any human being at the time, I doubted it. I wasn't sure. And, you know, you go back a few times and you experience things a few times and it starts to become more tangible, more like, okay, this really is what it's about. So that was my own personal experiences. But in addition to that, that's what the people who were gifted this technology say, you know, when we talk about, you know, I mentioned I had, a, you know, I've done a session earlier on today and, you know, they're talking about Ebola, like, oh, like what psychedelics are there in Africa? You know, I've heard of one Ebola. And I'm like, yeah, that's the one that I heard of first too. And that's the one that most people present and they present it as a, a psychedelic that's good for, you know, uh, you know, um, addictions, heroin addiction and alcohol addiction and recovery and trauma and stuff like that. And my question always was, you know, this is from Gabon, you know, from Central Africa. And now there are a bunch of heroin addicts running around in Gabon. Are there are a bunch of people, you know, at AA meetings in Gabon, you know, are they using Iboga for trauma relief in Gabon? And I come to find out there's not a bunch of heroin addicts in Gabon. They're not using it for AA meetings. Like, that's not what they use it for. So what do they say? Because this is who it was gifted to. It's their technology. It comes from the same soil that they come from. So I think that they're the ones who are best qualified to share with us and teach us what it's about. And they say, according to their own narrative, to their own stories, to their own traditions and mythologies, that Iboga was a gift that enabled them to communicate with their ancestors. It's the technology. It's ET phone home. It's your Bluetooth, your Wi-Fi, your personal hotspot. Call it what you want. It's a technology and that's what they say. And then you know what? I looked around the world and researched around the world and whether it's ayahuasca, salva divinorum, they all talk about it being tools that allow them to communicate with the ancestors, their spirits, their deities, their archetypes that they deal with. That's what this thing is fundamentally about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I call this stuff... Okay, well, we, we call this stuff artificial intelligence. The plants, yeah. the fungi, that's living intelligence. And yeah, you yeah. cannot top that. 
I'm sorry. I mean, I know these things are impressive and it's way cool. We get to do what we're doing, but I mean, oh my God, I think we barely scratched the surface when it comes yeah, yeah. to what we can really do with these plants. Kalindi was the one who presented to me, he was like, he referred to it. He said like, it's all about organic technology or the organic technology goes, it's the original artificial intelligence. The spores are the original artificial intelligence and they're organic. And any and everything that this phone can do, you can do. And the thing that makes this phone do what it does is inside of you. The same liquid crystal technology that those crystals are inside of you too. But when you use it and do it, you might end up getting section, you know, put in a mental house. And when you start saying that you can see or hear things that are not in the same space as you, that's what you can do on your phone, isn't it? You can talk to people in other places and spaces like you, this is what you can do. Um, you know, even if we go with our intuition and vibes, what's the weather like? What's the weather going to be like today? I'm in Barbados where people look up and they say, yeah, the, it's, the, scares are, the skies are clear, but they're like, yeah, it's going to be raining. I'm like, how do you know? Because they've got a weather app. <laughs> and even my weather app gives me misinformation on my phone. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just saying to say that we have those abilities, but I guess back in the days, you know, we had belief in that, we knew it. And then in the later days, they call it mumbo jumbo, black magic, juju, voodoo, and all that type of stuff. When you start tapping into that aspect of yourself. Yeah, I see that as uh, kind of like a corporate takeover uh, uh, under the guise of religion. <laughs> but, you know, like, oh, no, no, we'll handle this. <laughs> we'll be the mediators. You don't know what yeah. you're doing. You just go over there and be simple. We'll handle the big stuff. And uh, right. yeah, and just a, a complete disempowerment and uh, disconnect. And and I think people have been suffering ever since because it's like every I just say like this modern culture we're in, it's commercial culture. It is very it's so uh unhealthy in many many ways mm. and, uh, and so many people know there's more they know there's more but they can't quite put their their finger on it and i think this is also why so many people are earnestly seeking and they want this experience mm. they want well, to grow this came up the other day as well so i've just actually just finished an immersion here in barbados so you know but it came up the other day you know because this is our birthright you know this is our birthright we we would have been born into this knowing this stuff experiencing this stuff pre-childbirth but that's a, again another subject but the point is we're in the here and now where in the uk because i show, showed them the articles but i know it's in the states as well where there's mothers who have to break the law to get themselves sorted out I'll, if we can use them, I always say like, who's got shit to sort out? You know, we've all got shit to sort out. And it's like, there's mothers who've got to break the law, take class A drugs, schedule one drugs, because that's how it's been defined by the powers that be to sort their shit out. And when we was looking at all these articles, we're like, so what's challenging these mothers? What is it? What, you know, what's the problem? And the problem is clearly modern day life. Modern yes. day life is what brings the most stress to human beings where mothers who need to take care of their children cannot manage that. And that's like our birthright, their birthright. Like what the hell has happened where a mother can't just take care of a child and be all right. Like there's so many challenges that comes with that. And now they've got to break the law and find magic mushrooms to get some relief, to get some respite. Like, wow, finally I can, you know, take some time out for myself. So yeah, that's where we're at. But as I said, this would have been our birthright, a way of life. This would have been part and parcel of the traditions. And then there would have been a village. There wouldn't have just been one woman raising a child. There wouldn't have just been a mother and a father raising a child. There would have been a community raising a child and the children. And, you know, that's a whole nother story as well as to why we're in this current climate where things are the way they are. Yeah. What do you think about these intentional communities? I'm just curious because there are a number of people putting some really interesting communities together. And, and I feel like, and they're small and they're, you know, people of like mind. And I, I feel like we need more of that. I mean, you have to be careful, make sure you're in sort of with the right, the right. Mm. Totally. You know, um, you know, again, I, I, what can I say? There's different types of intentional communities because they've got different intentions. Yes. Yes. And I always, I always say to people, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, getting where you fit in. So, you know, if there's an intentional community for you, and it ticks all of your boxes and it's what you need, like, go for it. And if it isn't and it's not, like, leave it alone. You know, me personally, just this is just Darren's thing, is, like, I like diversity. Mm. Like, I don't like monoculture. Like, mm. although, I'm into what I'm, although I'm into what I'm into, I don't want to sit down with people all day just talking about mushrooms. You know, like, I'm, I mean, you know, like, and I've been in some of these communities, you know, where it's, like, all we're talking about is the same thing and 
that's the thing that Darren is like, after what I'm like, I don't know if this is what I'm into like that, you know? So just, you know, but I'm not anti it. I'm not against it. I'm just like, okay. yo, I've got to find my space and place and get in where I fit in and or co-create one that's conducive to me and, you know, and, and to, you know, what I'm all about. So, yeah, man, there's a lot of positive stuff going on, you know, people who are going back to the land, you know, and working, you know, doing 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 the right thing and, and I'm all for it and, I'm like, you know, all the best to you, man. I know people, especially a lot of people in the UK, I guess all around the world, you know, like going back to, you know, their original homes and seeing if they can reclaim land and start to set up shop because they're realizing that they've been mugged off being in the UK, you know, and disconnected from this stuff. And let me go and see if I can like just start growing my mango trees and banana trees and whatever healing medicines, you know, are available to me. And like, yeah, man, and if you're doing that with the right intentions and you have a common unity, then you'll go build those communities, man. Yeah. Well, it's like, we're in a sense, almost learning, learning kind of from scratch. Because mm -hmm. much of that has not been passed down for the bulk of us, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Got to kind of figure it out. And if we can figure it out with people of like mind and help each other, then, uh, you know, I think we're going to shift this world, hopefully, for, for the better. Now, you talk, and Kalindi, of course, my goodness, gave some amazing talks on the mushrooms in, in Africa. And so let's hear a bit about that in terms of whatever traditions were found there around the mushroom because it grows all over the place from what i understand yeah it definitely does it grows all over the place wherever there's mycelium there's some fungi growing you know i was doing some research today you know about you know the first people you know for lack of a better name adam and eve you know the first people to populate the planet earth as we know it today these are your so-called pygmy people of central africa you find you know groups in central africa you find some groups in the southern regions of, of africa in fact wherever you go around the world you're going to find out that most the indigenous first people are these small people these small brown to black skin curly wavy haired people that predate modern timelines of when we started all of this but again that's another subject but they've got their own narratives that say you know that they came here and have been doing this for a long time but they are the first foragers the first hunters and gatherers the first people to experience um food mushrooms you know and that terence mckenna talks about you know the stone date hypothesis hypothesis and theories if you know that in the savannah and it was you know a lush rainforest but as it started to dry up you have these early primates that came down and started ingesting psilocybin mushrooms like although i think there's true from falsehood and everything and all the information out there so there's some of that that resonates with me and some of it that doesn't simply because there's some people like these people who I'm talking about that say that they predate these stories, they predate these timelines. So when you hear their story and what they say, they like, they're saying like they arrived here with the spores, they arrived here on their spaceships, on their crafts, and like, it gets all like a bit mumbo jumbo for some people, but they say that they came out of the waters, they came out of the caves, and as they started to hunt and forage and get pieces to bit together, they were using mushrooms, just like we were using our phones nowadays, you know, they're using it for food, just like we can use Uber Eats or DoorDash. I know you've got DoorDash in America, you know, like just like we can use the technology, we can order food with it and like we can use it for weather. They was using it as tools of divination. And, you know, everything from, you know, the earliest people that we've, I've come across, which are these so-called pygmy people, through to the here and now, we've got an unbroken link of working with fungi. For what reasons? Like spiritual development and tools of communication. You know, you find that the ancient Egyptians or better yet, the Kemites were using it as what Kalindi taught me. And then I come to find out was ancient Egypt was just one big mushroom society. It was just a big mushroom cult society. There was nothing want to do with mushrooms or a byproduct from it. And what were they using it? Again, tools for communication, tools to communicate with, with the deities, with the archetypes, with the Natera or the Nateru. They also had their own vines. They had their own um, what's known as the acacia nihilitica, which is basically an acacia vine bush that grows along the Nile. And it was their own version of what we would call ayahuasca. They refer to it as the tree of life. And that's where all of the deities, all the archetypes came from. Or when you digest it or ingest it, you will go to their realms and hang out with them. So that's what Kalindi kept on saying to me, you know, do you want to keep reading about the gods, Darren? Or do you want to hang with the gods? So you need to take the right doses so you can go and hang with the gods. And that's what ancient Kemet was all about. And then you get to the, you know, the here and now where there's still these groups that are ancient, but they still have these practices and customs. You have like the Zulu tribes in Africa, in the southern regions who defeated the British in their first round of combat. There's a few rounds and yeah, some other stuff happened, but 
according to their own narrative, which you can find actually on YouTube. The, the documentary itself is called The Zulu and the Dark. Zulu Dawn, Zulu Dawn Mysteries. That's what the documentary is actually called. The Zulu, the Zulu Dawn Mysteries. The my yeah, the mysteries of the Zulu Dawn. Something along that. Google will sort it out for you. But um, you can find it on YouTube, and it's not under that title. The title it comes under on YouTube is, check this out, How the Zulus Defeated the British Using Psychedelics. One more time. How the Zulus defeated the British using psychedelics. Go check it out. It's a full documentary there. You can see it for yourself. They take the ancient practices that they were doing. They look at it at that time of period when the Zulus were utilizing it. And they bring it back to the to the to Europe and the Americas and do research on it on the lab, on these brews and concoctions that they were using, which would activate the warriors, the soldiers. And then you find that, that later on that the West, America and the UK were taking that type of knowledge and information and trying to create their own super soldiers. Again, you can find that stuff on YouTube and how they were using LSD and mushrooms for trials with the military. But they weren't getting the results that they expected to get at that time because, you know, they were putting the guns down and shrugging, hugging the trees and having a giggle and stuff like that. And when they were trying to get them to do the drills, they was like finding it a bit difficult. But there's a reason for that, in my humble opinion. Whereas, you know, when you're... When you're a warrior on the warrior's path and it's a rites of passage, you're taught the discipline that goes along with that. And you're not just going around killing innocent people just for the sake of it, you know, on some political beefs. So I think like mushrooms give you what you need and what not what you want. And although that's what they may have wanted to create these super soldiers of the West, what they needed was for them soldiers to put the, put, put the stuff down. And I guess that's why they put it down. And then made us all put the psychedelics down and then made it illegal. And yeah, that, again, that, you know, that's a whole, but that's a byproduct of some of the stuff that they found in Africa and the Americas. But again, in Africa, they use blue lotus. I know it's not a classic psychedelic, but it's considered very similar to like MDMA. And they would use it at parties. They would sniff it at parties. And, you know, so I'll say this to say in Africa, you see that they recorded everything after they realize that they were about to fall. So basically everything is pretty much oral traditions. So you can't just go in there and find a book about this stuff. But once they realized certain things were happening, they started to record and document this stuff on the walls. And the things that they documented on the walls are the, probably the three most important things, I guess, for them. And that was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I say it again, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. These were the important things to them. That are, these are the earliest depictions you can find in, in Africa, in the caves and in the hills and valleys. And they've got different postures, which later become the tantric arts, karma sutra, doggy style, you know, that type of vibe, observing nature, how nature does it, and saying, hey, this is important information. And then the drugs, obviously, you've got Terence McKenna and others who have highlighted, you know, the cave paintings that you find in the, in the Tassili Plateau in the northern parts of Africa with the bee shaman and the fertility goddess with her horns and stuff and this relationship between the cattle and the mushrooms and the people and then the rock and roll is the dance or the trance through the dance and the trance and the combination of the drugs and having sex there's some magic that happens that's all I know and I believe if you put all those ingredients together in the here and now you would also create amazing magic and I think that's what you know they were teaching in Africa and by the time the west got there they was like what's all this mumbo jumbo stuff about they're taking these mad crazy substances every day they're just celebrating and dancing around fires you know, and it just wasn't understood. But now, I don't know. They call it, where was I recently? And they was very into it. It's like, oh, I'll go to healing dance. I'll go to ecstatic dance classes. I go, it's like, ah, I'll get it. That's the stuff that we were doing in Africa, man. Like trauma release, like shaking all the trauma out and stuff. Like, yeah, we, we didn't own the trauma to start off with. Like our way of life is about releasing all of that all day, every day. Not when we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s with our back up against the wall, you know, wondering what the hell was going on. So yeah, man, that's like why and how. we. So there's just a few little bits and pieces around how we use psychedelics in Africa, or the different types of psychedelics and how we use them. And the one that they were actually using within the Zulu, when they done their, done their concoctions, when they done um, the results to see that what constituents were in these brews, they found cannabis, they had this mixture called bufane, which is like an, another another admixture. And they also found that there was the cousin to Amanita muscaria, which was the Amanita pantherina. And the Am Amanita pantherina, you find again, growing all over the place. They were using this at the right doses to activate 
the what I would call the Robocop or the Terminator, their extra sensory perceptions, they're being able to see further, hear further and all that. And they were using that as a form of warfare. And Kalindi being the master martial artist that he was, was would teach us about all those types of things. Yeah, well, it makes perfect sense. And also for hunting as well, which McKenna spoke as well. I mean, all yeah. of them. It, it really does make you superhuman in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. or, or maybe we, it, it maybe superhuman is the wrong uh, term because maybe really it just makes you more human. <laughs> it, it just opens you to the deeper layers of what it is really to be a human because that's yeah. been so yeah. shut down. And people are li just literally shut down in many ways now. You know, everyone's mm -hmm. working for mm -hmm. the corporation in this very kind of commercialized, superficial way of living. And people are miserable and they're unhealthier than I think they've probably ever been. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And with all with all what we're, we supposedly have, with all the technology, with all, all this stuff, like it's like interesting so i'll go back to those you know those so-called primitive people who according to their own narrative say that they've been here so long that they've seen civilizations many civilizations rise and fall rise and fall to become the peak of what humans can become to fall again and what they've decided the the pygmy tradition suggests so they're not referred to as pygmies let me give for clarity they're known as the akka the baka the booty the babongo in the middle in the middle africa down south they're known as the koi sound or the sand the koi koi so they have their own names but generally people refer to them as you know the pygmy groups but these groups suggest that they've experienced high civilizations and what they realize is that the more you build on civilization, the higher you build or the more you become, the more you destroy. So rather than trying to build and build bigger buildings and bigger this and bigger that and big, 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 let's just keep it simple. That's why you see them running around with grass skirts and stuff because nature provides you everything that you need. You don't, you know, like the sewing machines are already there, you know, like it's, it's all there. The plates, the cups, the saucers, they're already there. The calabashes are there. Like nature provides you with everything you need. You just need to have the intuition and the relationship with nature and the lens to see the, the beauty for what it really is. And again, psychedelics really help you with that, man. You start seeing things for their value and more than, that they bring even more than what you think, you know, and that's how they were able to discover the combination of these concoctions, you know, that you take the technology and the plants talk to you and they tell you, you know, like you can mix me with this plant and this will be good for this. Or once you finish with me, you can turn me into a bowl, you know, like you, you, it gives you the information that you need, man. And that's the relationship that we've had and continue to have with the nature and psychedelics in Africa. Yeah, I think they were the original teachers. <laughs> you yeah, know, they didn't have schools back then, but nature yeah. was the schoolroom. Nature was everything. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, let's, we are at, I think we're at an hour. So I'm going to invite listeners to join us on my Substack and subscribe. And I would love for you to talk about the alien piece here very curious to hear what you have to say with regard to the mushrooms so i will look forward to everyone joining us in the second hour